Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ronan, and this is uh, Agustin. Hello. And uh, as you can see, the name of our presentation today is Understanding the Windows SMB NTLM Authentication Weak NAS Vulnerability. So basically, the idea of the presentation is to describe this vulnerability in detail, to uh, explain and demo uh, three different techniques that we developed to exploit this vulnerability. We are also going to uh, clarify some misconceptions that I think people have about this vulnerability. Uh, we are also talking about the scope, the uh, severity, and the uh, impact of this vulnerability, because I also think that that is not very clear. Uh, clear. Also, I think that uh, if you have read the uh, advisory published by Microsoft, some of the things that uh, are there, I don't want to say are not accurate, but not the whole uh, history, story, story is there. And finally, we're going to pretty much uh, make a summary of the things that we describe uh, through the presentation and uh, share some things that I think some security issues that we can, can be reminded of uh, by this vulnerability and that perhaps you can apply in the future when uh, analyzing uh, similar protocols like NTLM. Basically, this, is, uh, this vulnerability is not just one vulnerability but consists in a series of flaws in the way that Windows uh, implemented the NTLM authentication protocol. Uh, an attacker that can exploit these flaws can access the SMB service without any kind of credentials, and once he has uh, done that, he can gain real access to files, can gain access to any kind of uh, resource that is being shared used, uh, using SMB, and also execute uh, code remotely by using DCE, RPC, over SMB. <clears throat> we published this vulnerability at the beginning of this year, and uh, we also published uh, an advisory at that point in time, and uh, there is a patch already for the, uh, this vulnerability. So why do we think that it's worth talking about this vulnerability? Well, basically, the flaws that we found in the implementation of NTLM, that is basically the most widely used uh, authentication protocol in the world, <laughs> have been there for not only 14, actually 17 years. So this basically means that uh, since Microsoft shipped the first version of Windows NT, and that is Windows NT 3.1, up until February of this year, the uh, NTLM authentication protocol has been seriously flawed. So if you have been uh, worried about attacks such as SMB relay, or also known as, as uh, the SMB credential reflection attack, or pre-compute uh, dictionary attacks against NTLM version one, well, I think that this is basically worse than that because the protocol implementation was uh, flawed, allowing for other attacks that are more dangerous that, than those ones. <clears throat> and this uh, flaw, like I said, affects all versions of Windows, from Windows NT 3.1, NT 4, 2000 XP, 7, 2008, all versions were vulnerable. <clears throat> Besides that, we also think that from a technical standpoint, this is uh, kind of an interesting vulnerability because we're not talking about something that is more common to find nowadays, like buffer, overf buffer overflows, integer overflows, or things like that. But this vulnerability or series of flaws has to do with issues in the pseudo-random number generator user using, used by the uh, implementation of NTLM that we think is pretty interesting. It's not something that you find all, all, uh, all the time. And also other implementation issues that we found in the protocol that allow for side channel attacks that can result in, for example, replay attacks, and also an attack that also we think that by itself is very interesting, that is the possibility of uh, predicting challenges. And we're gonna see what all this means. So in order to understand the flaws, you need to understand how NTLM works. NTLM is basically a protocol that belongs to a family of protocols that, is called, that are called challenge response authentication protocols, or perhaps uh, cryptographic child response authentication protocols. So what is a child response authentication protocol? Well, the idea is pretty simple. You have a client that wants to authenticate against the server. The client wants to prove to the server that he is who he says he is. Both entities, the client and the server, share a secret, for example, a password. And the client wants to prove to the server that he knows the secret, in this case, for example, the password, but without actually sending the password. Otherwise, we will be talking about something like uh, the channel service where, when, where you are sending the password. And we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to avoid revealing the password because we are doing all this 
over a, a channel that is not encrypted at all. <clears throat> so how you do that? The solution, of, the solution proposed by a channel response protocol to this problem is to, every time that the client wants to authenticate against the server, the client initiates uh, an authentication attempt against the server, the server generates what is called a challenge, the uh, client receives that challenge and performs uh, some kind of computation, uh, applies a function or an algorithm to that challenge and to the secret. Takes the result of that calculation, sends that result to the uh, server, the server applies the same function or algorithm to both the secret and the challenge, and if the results match, that means that the client knew the secret. And the secret, that in this case could be the password, was actually never sent to the server. One thing that is very important about this whole scheme is that the challenge, that is usually a number, has to have certain properties. If the challenge does not have these properties, the whole protocol falls apart. The security of the protocol breaks. Uh, once uh, some of these uh, properties that the challenge needs to have, this challenge, the challenge is usually a number, and this number needs to be non-predictable. For example, if it is, if the challenges are one, two, three, then four and five, that's predictable because you know that the next challenge is the previous one plus one, so that's not good. Also, the challenge has to be a unique number. If you, for example, issue the numbers one, two, 20, 19, two again, you don't want that because that also breaks the protocol. So those are very important things that the protocol have to adhere to. If these properties are not, meant, uh, not met by the challenge, that is usually called a NANS, hence the name of the vulnerability, some attacks can happen. For example, if the channel, if the server generates duplicate challenges, that is, generates the same challenge over and over again in a short period of time, what an attacker can do is just, if the attacker is able to eavesdrop the communications between the client and the server, he can just look at the traffic without knowing nothing, just look at the traffic and create a dictionary of challenges sent by the server and responses sent by the client. So he has like a dictionary where, where he has a column with uh, nonces or challenges and a column with the responses. Just by having that, since the attacker knows that the server is going to issue duplicate challenges, what the attacker does is connect over and over again against the server until the server responds with a challenge that the attacker has seen before and that he has in his dictionary. So for example, in this case, the server uh, issued the challenge, the number two, the client issued the response four, he, the, the attacker grabs that and saves that, and then the attacker starts performing authentication attempts against and again and again against the server until the server returns again the challenge two, and at that point he replays the response that he got previously and can gain access. So that's the problem that can happen if the server generates uh, duplicate challenges. The other thing is, for example, if uh, the challenge is predictable, let's say that the attacker can predict when the server, at which point in time the server is going to generate certain challenge, that is a number. So by knowing that, the attacker actually uses the client, forces somehow a connection from the client to the attacker to obtain the corresponding response for that challenge. So now the final step is the same as before, but this time, the attacker connects at the exact time that he knows the server is going to generate the challenge that he predicted, and at that point sends back the response that he got from the client and gains access. If we take a look at uh, NTLM, it works exactly like this generic, generic example. Here you can see a typical NTLM version one uh, authentication uh, uh, communication. For example, when the client wants to communicate with the server, the client sends an SMB negotiated protocol request packet that initiates the authentication attempt. The server, the server responds with the, the challenge, then in the case of NTLM it's an eight byte long uh, challenge or nonce. The client sends back a response. We don't care for our purposes how this response is actually calculated. But as you can see, it includes the username, the domain, and the hashes of the password. That, that would be the secret in this case. The server performs the same calculation that the client did to send back the response, since he also knows the, the hashes of the password of the user. And if everything matches, 
allows or disallows access to the client. So here you can see a typical example of uh, NTL, uh, an uh, NTLM version one uh, authentication process. Basically, so you can actually see what uh, goes over the wire. You can see the challenge in red over there sent by the server and uh, in the bottom of the slide you can see the response sent back by the client. If we take a look at NTLM version two, it's practically the same. The only thing that changes is how the client calculates the response that is sent back to the server. By pretty much, it works the same way. Again, a typical example of what you would see over the wire, the challenge generated by the server and the response sent back by the client. So, since this is uh, a challenge response authentication protocol, the nonsense generated by the server, the nonsense generated by the server, need to have the properties that I said before when I was talking about the generic example of a challenge response protocol. It needs to be non-predictable and needs to be unique. Otherwise, we have a problem. So basically the thing is, if you connect over and over again against a Windows server, you should expect that the server will return a nonce that is non-predictable and always a different number. Well, the first, found, the first uh, flaw that we found actually was that the server was returning uh, repeated challenges. And that's a big problem because that is breaking the security of the protocol. And not only that, it was not returning duplicate challenges, but it was doing so in a very short period of time. Because it's not the same thing, the same thing if you get a, a duplicate once a year, for example. But if you get a duplicate once every two seconds, for example, that's a bigger problem because you can do all the attacks that I uh, talk about when talking about uh, the generalities of a channel response authentication protocol. <laughs> so basically, I was think here is going to show you some uh, plots that we did that are trying to show you how often, how many, and how are the nonces generated by a Windows server that is vulnerable to this vulnerability. Hi. So uh, we wanted to, to have a visual idea of how often the server was generating duplicate challenges. So uh, we perform multiple connections to the server and save all the challenge, all challenges. So uh, we saved a sample of 64K samples and we try to plot them. So we counted the number of occurrences of each challenge and uh, plotted it in a graph. So for example, this is the first uh, 4K sections of the sample where there are only unique uh, challenges, so they are plotted at number one. And if the challenges uh, are duplicated, they will plot at number two, for example. This is the first 8K section of the sample where we can see duplicates. And here, uh, this is the first 16K of the sample where we start uh, observing uh, three times issued uh, challenges. And this, for example, this is the whole sample where we can see how the duplicate line is getting thicker, uh, mimicking the unique uh, challenges, for example. So, Going back to the 16K sample, we can see some kind of uh, small pattern duplication. There are four little dashes there uh, that I want to know what's happening there, so I have to visualize each duplication in a separate way. So we plotted that in a different way. We assign to each uh, duplication of the challenge a unique ID, and we plotted the pairs. So. If we imagine the duplicate ID as a progression, or we can see it as a curve, we can see different regions and we can see different patterns. For example, we have a pattern A, which, which is found in steep regions of the curve, meaning that within a short time frame, uh, a lot of challenges that are going to be issued are going to be duplicated later. And we can see a pattern B, in smooth regions of the curve, meaning that within a time frame, uh, the issue challenges are not going to be duplicated later. And we can also see a pattern C, which is found below the curve of uh, IDs, uh, which mimics a pattern A, and that means that uh, within a short time frame, a lot of duplicate challenges were issued